Good morning, swords, and good morning from Michael Mackin. Good morning. Who's going to uh, join me on my walk or on our walk uh, around swords? We might have to speak a little quietly because it's 6 a.m. in the morning here, and we don't want to wake people up. I'll hand the camera over to Michael now, and we'll do the presentation. So today we're going to talk about medieval swords. Swords was a medieval town and it comprised of 122 burgages. Well, what's a burgage? Well, a burgage is a rented plot of land, usually rented out to one owner, but can be also subdivided uh, later on. Now, when the Normans came in 1169, their form of town planning was to allot bur burgages, burgages to all the citizens. And obviously, if you had one of these burgages, you were a privileged person, you had a right to vote, you had access to Main Street, and you also had a place uh, in the town and market so you could sell your goods, whether they were leather goods, metal goods, whether they were horticultural produce uh, or, or others. So these were the first people to settle in swords in a systematic uh, way. Uh, Archbishop Common developed 122 burgages and they'll all line Main Street on the east and on the west. And the thing is that even today, the traces of those burgages can be readily seen. And Michael and myself are going to test out the size of the bur burgages using this particular measure. This measure is a statute perch, not the fish. It was a measurement introduced by the Normans specifically for measuring land. So four perches by 40 perches makes an acre. And obviously they wanted to know the size of the land so they could set the rent for, for the person uh, using it. Now Swords was not the only town to have burgages in it. Lusk had them, places like Rathcool had them. Obviously the Norman centres of Waterford, uh, Dublin and Galway they also had burgages, but Professor Bradley has given his opinion that the medieval burgages of swords are better preserved in this particular village than anywhere else. The perch measurement has a very interesting history. I first came across the per perch measurement when I was looking at the authorship of Noxidan Bridge. And this was in 1832 and a number of famous engineers sent in applications uh, to do the bridge and one of those was an engineer called Alexander Nimmo, a very famous engineer who built a lot of quays and harbours uh, in the west of Ireland. Nimmo, when he costed up the, the price for the job, it came to £1,757 at the time and Nimmo calculated that by using a square perch. The square perch is also a measure of volume and mass, so in that unit he had calculated for labour, for the parts needed, and for any other expenses that he would incur uh, during the, getting the job. It actually happened that Nemo didn't get the contract. It was awarded to an engineer called W.I. Duncan, and the bridge was duly built uh, in 1832. You'll see that this measurement is quite long, and the word perch really comes from the uh, long wooden pike weapon that people used in the 15th century, say the land connect of uh, German armies. So you'll see some of the pictures of these pikes and they were ever so long, giving them an advantage over horsemen and over infantry. And we think that this measure, the perch, may originally have come from this particular uh, piece of, of military equipment. A perch measures exactly 16 and a half uh, feet. And the perch was still in use in the UK right up to 1968 when the Weights and Measurements Act made it uh, re redundant. So this is the perch and all the burgages in swords abutting Main Street are all one perch long in frontage are multiples of same. So some are 33, which would be two perches, and some would be 48 or 49, which would be three perches. That's the case with the toll house that Michael and myself are just going to uh, see uh, ju just now. Let's walk ahead. 
So, Michael, your family are in Swords for a long time. They're very uh, eminent, as you are yourself. <laughs> well, I was born and reared in Swords. My dad was from St. Margaret's. My mother's family lived in Swords for many years before me. Up in the old Brackenstown cottages with Mill Lance. You were saying that your parents kept a kind of open house there? Um, with a welcome for everybody? It was a bit like that, yeah. There was, uh, a it friendly was house? Very much so. There was always people coming and going. Um, Nobody, nobody was ever turned away without being fed either. My mother was. Isn't that wonderful? And you have great admiration for your mum. Absolutely, yeah. She was. She seemed to keep everything together. She was incredible, like cooking and baking. And worked hard. Very hard, very hard. But she did a good job, fair play. She did a good job. We're standing here now at the top end of uh, Swords Village, especially the Main Street. It's good to know that the road here is actually called the Dublin Road and it just ends opposite the Old Borough School where Swords Main Street or Swords High Street takes off uh, uh, from there. Swords Main Street has a long and illustrious history and one of the things to notice about the buildings along it is they're rectilinear. In other words, they're all in a straight line because they retain the outlines of the original Burgage plots. Irish place names with Boris in them, like Boris in Ossery or Boris in Furlong, they also had burgages because in Irish the rent for a burgess is called Boreas. So Boris in Ossery or Boris uh, in uh, England. As you see on the other side, in when the Normans came the axis of the town changed. It changed from a, an east-west axis to a north-south axis. And the road we're looking over here was the main road into Swords in the medieval times. So remember that there was at least a thousand years of the monastic site before the Normans came and realigned the population along this rectilinear line that we see today on uh, Main Street. The spot we're on now is very poignant and is full with a lot of memories because this is where the buses for emigration to England actually stopped and there would have been a lot of tear tearful farewells uh, and a lot of sadness at just this particular spot on Main Street. We'll now walk ahead and just look at this building which was the old toll house in Swords. There was a toll stretched across the road. The fee would have been one penny to cross it. And naturally, people didn't want to pay the toll, so they didn't actually enter the village. They skirted down through this road on the uh, east-west east -west axis, as we said before. People paid the tolls into this particular house. I've already measured this particular house and its proportions. And we can be confident that this house actually sits on a burgage plot. In fact, I measured it at 47 feet, which is just too short of the 49 that would be required for it to be a trip. So, using our measurement, you can see this would be one third. roughly and three thirds as we said a perch is 16 and a half feet so three times 16 and a half is 48 or 49 in this case there will be small modifications on the plot for width of walls for the alignment of the roof and so on but even in this first house in swords we find confirmation of the notion that burgages still exist right into modern times. I haven't actually measured the plot. But when we apply our plot, you can see that it's almost exactly a double plot which would be 49 feet. Or, 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 or. 
A general point to make is that the Burgesses were much better preserved on the east side of the village than on the west. This is because the river ward put a, a stop on development uh, on, the, on the west side of Swords, whereas uh, on the east side they could build further into the land and take up more uh, building land and put more, more buildings on it. And this little cottage, as you can see, is one of the earliest buildings in Swords. It's a remainder of the cottages that would have lined Swords Main Street. See how the burgage measurement works out uh, in this particular place. So, so far we've got one perch, which is 16 and a half feet. Slightly longer, but taking account of the measurements of the, the wall, that's measured at 32 or 33 feet exactly to purchase at the target uh, shop. We walk ahead down Main Street, Michael. Thank you. Now, I was just saying that the burgages on the east side of Swords are so much better preserved than on the right. When we look at the Ordnance Survey maps, we can see a great, a great cluster of burgage plots located over now where the pavilions uh, are now sited. So, the burgages on the east side were not as well preserved uh, as on the west. And we're walking ahead, past by what, two, what some people call Well Road. You're pretty familiar with the terrain and swords, eh, Michael, I think? Yeah. yeah with the, the, you grew up here and went to school grew, here? I grew up and went to school there. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about that? Would have spent a lot of time um, playing around the valley, the, the Jacko oh, as it's now right. locally. And, Right, what um, did you get up to down there? Were you swimming um, or? Uh, only good things, Michael. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't tell me about the no, bad anyway, would no, you? No, no you wouldn't. Uh, You're a wise the, man. The, the Jacko has had a lot of different nicknames over the years. The, oh, yeah. the Jacko itself being a nickname. Oh yeah. But one of the nicknames it had was the Moonlight Cafe. Ah. Because a lot of people used to. Ah. I never heard that like, before. Used to use it like a cafe late at Fantastic. night. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe there were amorous assignations. Quite possible. And so on up there. Quite possible. Not that I would know anything about that's, that. that. That's great. Thank you, Michael. We're now stopped at the outside of presently Witherspoons. But originally the Old Borough School, uh, founded in, eight, built in 1818 by Francis Johnson, the architect who built uh, the GPO uh, and uh, St. George's Church in, uh, in Dublin. Dublin Street ends just at the centre of that road and towards High Street or Main Street uh, begins there. Can we just walk ahead, Michael? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you had a happy time in the valley? And yeah, it was, sort of, it, was, it was a very different place, obviously, when we uh, were growing up. Uh, uh, that was really just more or less the Main Street here. Oh, yes. Um, I grew up in Glassmore, which is kind of the second housing estate yeah, we yeah, built yeah, after Seatown. Yes, it is. Very settled. So uh, it was a lot different then. A lot of green fields. Yeah, yeah. A good place to grow up. Perfect. All, we were Perfect. out all day, every day. Yeah. Ex thank you, Michael. Uh, just excuse me. So we're now entering on the east side of Swords. And if you just train the camera along down there, you can see how rectilinear or the line of the houses is never broken. It's, it's completely continuous. Swords Main Street is 800 meters long and it's 80 yards wide. And as we said, it was not the first road in Swords by any means. The first road was all the activities based, based on, the, on the monastic site. We'll just walk ahead, Michael, and just before we do, there's such beautiful limestone sculpture uh, on this particular building. So it was very high class materials used in it. And down here, we see a mason's mark. And the mason's mark was a guarantee that this particular mason and his team did good work and could be uh, contacted afterwards for extra jobs. So it's a kind of an advertisement. So 
So now we begin the part of Swords Main Street, which is most telling in relation to the Burgages. And this first plot was uh, Walsh, as it was named in the, ninth, in the 20, early 1900s. They had one of the few steel making and turning businesses here in Swords. So if we just put our measure down here, I've al already measured this, and this comes in at exactly A good bit since your day? Yeah, most definitely. The buildings? Uh, it's funny, growing up in it, you, you didn't really notice the change as it was happening. Ah. But it, it just it seemed to spread really, really quick in the 80s with the growth of the airport and with the bypass in particular. And River Valley would have been one of the first. Yeah, River Valley I think started in the 70s, it, the early 70s. It, it states. Yeah. yeah. We're stopped now at three buildings which have separate roof lines, at least the, the one there does. And if we put our measure down, you'll see the measure I've made already there. 16 and a half feet exactly. So that's one perch. And the next one. Another perch. So two per two uh, burgage plots each with a front a, a frontage of 16 and a half feet. Um, if you could just show that there might because it's bang on the 16 and a half feet. And in a little while we'll be going down to see how these uh, buildings how they come down to the river and we'll see at the river that one of these plots with this garden measures the exact perch, that is, the exact statute perch, which is 16 and a half feet. That, that's brilliant. We're walking on past uh, one of the first openings uh, in, in, in Swords uh, Main Street. There are a number of lanes that radiate off from uh, the Main Street itself. And one thing just to notice in relation to where Michael is, is filming, you can see the difference in height from the level here down to the river. The river regularly flooded, even up to Main Street, it, 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 it was told. So various methods were tried to keep the river within its bank. Some of them succeeded and some didn't. But the main thing that the Normans wanted to do was they put in a high street that was high and dry above the river for most of the year. So Michael, if you'd just like to scan down to Main Street, um, if you're wondering what the trees are, these are uh, London plain trees. They're very resilient to pollution and so on. And many of these were put in prior to uh, Queen Victoria's visit to Ireland uh, in the latest and 1900s. That the Burgage plots and the traces from them lasted longer in swords than in any other medieval town in Ireland. We walk ahead, Michael. It, uh Going back to the that Norman times, the yes. river being a lot higher than it is now, and I don't mean in height, but the amount of water in the chair. Yeah. Absolutely. With loads of pictures of the old mill down opposite the castle. And to drive a mill you need a volume of water, and the water would have been 14 feet higher than it is today. Now if you ask where the extra water came from, uh, I don't really know. But Michael, you asked a very good question definitely higher than in those days. Good. Now, one of the things about Swords is that it was a municipal ca capital. It actually was a rival to Dublin in the medieval times, that's around 1100, due mainly to the Norman uh, settlement within the village and the economic activity within the village, which generated uh, income for Archbishop Common, and also gave privileges to the Burgess uh, holders. The red brick building we look at, you probably know, is the old uh, dispensary. And the dispensary was twinned with the Old Borough School to provide free medical care to children from poorer families and who needed it. 
So if you look around the village of Swords, while there are not a lot of plaques commemorating the Republican tradition, apart from Richard Coleman's, a famous exception, I believe that Swords was a sort of an ascendancy, an ascendancy village. It was influenced more by English manners and language. And as we know, it was a complete central hub uh, of the Pale back from uh, the earliest uh, me medieval days. Swords contains a lot of the buildings that are needed to run a city, a county and a barony. So further down is the county jail, opposite is the courthouse. There were five or six schools, even back in the 19th century, so the levels of literacy were considered higher uh, in Swords. There was uh, social services available, like coal and free medical treatment, that was available to the inhabitants of Swords then. This all bespeaks a very settled and a very um, anti-nationalistic um, vibe within the Swords village, especially in the 19th century, and of course there were exceptions to that, particularly the Battle of Ashburn, uh, which was fought uh, back in the, in the 1900s. Michael, we'll just walk ahead. So, we're now coming to this old cottage, and if our hypothesis is correct, that it stands on a burgage plot, we'll have to check it out. Uh, I think a lady called Margaret Torp, Torp, Torp yeah. Yeah, used to live here, yeah. and this is obviously one of the oldest uh, and least affected buildings uh, by future development and source. So when we put our measurements down, we find uh, one perch. Thanks for that, Michael. The house sits exactly on a burgage plot of 32 and a half um, uh, feet, confirming that this was once a very stable uh, burgage plot, and it seems to confirm confirm our idea and thought that burgage plots remain unbroken and unchanged since the 1200s, thus conferring a medieval status on the town of Swords. The last video I did was about other aspects of medieval Swords and just to say that I've recently come across part of the old wall of Swords. Swords was originally a wall town Originally it would have had a dike or a ditch, and subsequently then, uh, in the Norman times, uh, there was a, a, a wall surrounding the town to protect the citizens. And we talked about the burgesses, but if the town was in danger, they had a duty to go and defend the town, so that was another obligation that they had along with their uh, status. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at the castle uh, down below, but just to say that the castle was actually more an administrative centre than it was a defensive uh, formation. So there's two centres of administration in Swords. One of them is the castle and the other one is on uh, the right-hand side, which is Swords uh, County Council who do such good uh, restoration work uh, in Swords and, and the village. We've come now to a little lane, it's called Gannon's Lane, and let's walk ahead and see what we can see down here, Michael. Thank you. You would have come through these lanes a good lot, would you? Yeah, the, the, like obviously there was none of these shops or anything in, in these. And what the, was it then? Um, it would have been just open space mostly, and a lot of the, a lot of the time it would be closed off as well. You you couldn't have access to the river through some of them. The one we passed further up was yeah. always open. Yes, right. This, this one here would have been closed off. All oh, right, I didn't know that. It was probably private land. Yeah. But yeah. There was no buildings on them at that time. Oh yeah. Thank you, Michael. So, we're now coming down to the river, and if you notice the big incline from Main Street, or High Street, as it was sometimes called, down to the river, we know the river flooded up to Main Street, so there was a lot more volume of water in the river, a much more uh, powerful current. Thank Michael, you. if you just turn the camera uh, just down here, here is where the River War takes its famous uh, turn north, and uh, it's moved out by these very solid limestone blocks, so it's its route, which was going uh, east, has now been moved 
to, to go north. If you look at the maps, you can see the definite uh, twist in the river. And let's just walk along and see how our burgage theory works out with the back end of these houses. But you can see the way our perch, uh, you can see that that's almost exactly the 16 and a half feet. Would you agree, Michael? Yes, yeah, it fits so right in line with the different sections. This plot is uh, one statute perch or 16 and a half uh, uh, feet long. Some of the burgages had access to the river, which would have been a great advantage, and some of them didn't, so that their plot ended halfway up uh, the actual garden. So we walk ahead, Mike. Uh, you run uh, a men's uh, walk and talk group uh, every Monday night, Michael. I think it's been a, a great success for you. Would yes. you like to say what was your thinking in setting it up? Well, it's going very well for us, uh, I have to say. It, it came on the back of the... Um the men's sheds groups said uh, they were oh, yeah. all they were all closed down during the pandemic um, with the government restrictions. I see. And meeting in groups wasn't wasn't allowed effectively. So I see. A few guys decided to meet, just go for a walk and meet, what? have a cup of coffee somewhere along the line. What a great idea! And it, it grew from that, and it's been a great success, I have to say. I, I walk with the group, and I can confirm it's a great concept uh, and a very healthy concept. Uh, men are not joiners by nature and uh, during COVID we lost a lot of our social support so Michael's group is working actively to counteract uh, that kind of anxiety or fear that some people uh, may have and on average there would be maybe 12 in the group each Monday it varies according to Yes, yeah, uh, go from anything from 5 or 6 up to 13 or 14 and well, it's very well supported, I have to say. And, um, I can highly recommend it to all the men folk uh, in Swords. Uh, I think it was the ladies that gave the inclination because we often see them on a Monday night jogging up the road, even in winter time. So we're now back on Main Street. And just to look at the, uh, the rectilinear nature uh, of the street, as you look down and as you look up, no building protrudes onto the main street and that is because all the burgages had standardized frontages to the street and they have carried on even to this day so we're walking down now michael some of the development here has helped uh, the main street uh, and some haven't i could recommend to everybody if they have a moment to go into the arches uh, Gastro pub now and look at a map uh, done by the famous uh, Richard Griffiths. The date on his map is July 1847, so this was just directly after the famine. Now, Griffith's job here was to enumerate the houses exactly so they could be taxed. And in his enumeration, he noted there were 65 settled houses in Main Street. So how that approximates to a population, I don't know. But every era has different settlement characteristics. The Normans had the burgages. In the 60s, we had housing estates. Uh, and we also had building along roads uh, in Ireland, the so-called bungalow blitz. So it's good if we can see the burgage development in Swords within a context of constantly evolving uh, human settlement. So today, unfortunately, I understand that there may be, may be only one or even less people actually living and inhabiting a building on Main Street. Main Street has become commercially more desirable than residential. We'll continue on just to look at this particular uh, shop. It looks like a burgage. It looks like... that Michael? Yeah, absolutely. And the next one, the taxi rank, uh, is also the same. <laughs> this one measures exactly 16 and a half feet or one uh, statute perch. And when we look at the lintel on this house, it's a granite lintel, so that bespeaks a, a, a rich house or a more uh, affluent house. And on it, you can see the wear and tear of centuries of people's boots uh, flattening uh, the granite.
And the typical organization of a burgage plot was it had frontage onto Main Street, it had a business perhaps uh, in the back. Uh, this part of the burgage is called a toft. A toft is a yard or an area that's used for manufacturing something. It could have been working in leather, could have been um, working in, in wood or working in stone. In the, 12th, in the 13th century, everything had to be made. There was no uh, mechanization, so that gave a lot of work uh, to people. And then the rest of the plot was devoted to growing vegetables, uh, keeping a pig, keeping chickens, and so on. So these were all benefits conferred by Archbishop Common to a selected group. Uh, who got allocated uh, those burgages. And of course, Archbishop Common was a kind of a grasping uh, man and not above giving jobs to his brother, which he created a, a bishop. And Archbishop Common, being an English person uh, under an English pope, Adrian uh, IV, I think, uh, was not inclined to see a whole lot of good in the native Irish and in their customs and practices. So when the Normans came, they said, we're founding a new settlement centered on this main road and detached both symbolically and historically from St. Columbus site uh, from uh, 1560. All these influences have gone to make the high street or main street that we see today. And I suppose the next step logically would be for main street to become pedestrianised and the traffic short-circuited uh, around the town. We'll see if that actually happens. I know it's happened in Malahide lately. They've done more pedestrianisation. Thank now, at this end of Main Street, these were prize burgages. These were the ones that maybe had a higher charge, like you would see in a housing estate. Some are two beds, some are three beds, some are four beds. These burgages down here were the prime burgages. And why? Because they were directly beside the castle, lots more footfall, and lots more business and an outlet to sell uh, the particular produce. So we're going to finish our survey at the end of the town. Looking at this particular building. Yep. Not far off it, Michael. Yeah. This house used to be a post office in the Victorian times. And so much activity and sorts happened around here. Political meetings were held o o over there. Uh, people used to sun themselves uh, here and kids would come from school. So this particular plot we're on is hallowed with the history and the footsteps of so many uh, sorts people. Now, we've looked at a lot of the houses along Main Street. I hope you feel that you've got some sense of, or giving you some sense of the impact of the 1200 colonization, Archbishop colonization, on the development of swords. Going forward into time, we know that swords in the 13th and 14th century had a number of pubs. One of them was called the Anchor Pub. And the biggest change came, I suppose, in 1640 after the Cromwellian invasion, where a lot of the land was taken from Catholics who were sent to Baron Boggs uh, in Connacht and the land, their land given to Protestants uh, and English-speaking people. Swords occupies a very ambiguous position politically. Sometimes it was anglicised, sometimes there was more of an Irish influence. And the amount of people in the village didn't really make a whole lot of difference. It was an ascendancy area, a heartland of the Pale. We say goodbye until next time. Cheerio. Thank you, it's been, Michael. It's been a pleasure.